Hello everyone and welcome to the CyberWire's Research Saturday, presented by the Hewlett Foundation Cyber Initiative. I'm Dave Bittner, and this is our weekly conversation with researchers and analysts tracking down threats and vulnerabilities and solving some of the hard problems of protecting ourselves in a rapidly evolving cyberspace. Thanks for joining us. And now, a moment to tell you about our sponsor, the Hewlett Foundation Cyber Initiative. While government and industry focus on the latest cyber threats, we still need more institutions and individuals who take a longer view. They're the people who are helping to create the norms and policies that will keep us all safe in cyberspace. The Cyber Initiative supports a cyber policy field that offers thoughtful solutions to complex challenges for the benefit of societies around the world. Learn more at hewlett.org slash cyber. And thanks also to our sponsor, Enveil, whose revolutionary zero-reveal solution closes the last gap in data security, protecting data in use. It's the industry's first and only scalable commercial solution enabling data to remain encrypted throughout the entire processing lifecycle. Imagine being able to analyze, search, and perform calculations on sensitive data, all without ever decrypting anything, all without the risks of theft or inadvertent exposure. What was once only theoretical is now possible with Enveil. Learn more at Enveil.com. And be sure to check out Enveil at the RSA Early Stage Expo, Booth 32. The problem is that there's this kind of essential tension between governments who want access to, to data, specifically to communications data. That's Charles Wright. He's an assistant professor at Portland State University, along with Mayank Varia, a research associate professor at Boston University. They're co-authors of a new paper, Crypto Crumple Zones, enabling limited access without mass surveillance. Law enforcement, national security kind of purposes Sort of the, the same way that uh, they have lawful ability to, for example, get a wiretap on a traditional telephone line. Uh, now they're starting to realize that they would also like access to you know, encrypted Internet calls. And as encryption becomes much more commonplace and more people realize that we need this in our everyday lives to protect ourselves from cyber criminals and, and data theft and all these other threats, the way we've built our systems kind of leads to this inherent conflict between um, our tools that are built to give you confidentiality and privacy from everyone, and then the governments are saying they have uh, a legitimate need to to get access to this kind of data. And just the, the way that we've been constructing our system so far, it's really been a either, you know, it's an all or nothing deal. It's, it's black or white. There hasn't been a way to build a system that allows only, you know, legitimate, lawful, uh, warranted access uh, but at the same time, keeps everybody else out. And so we, we'd like to get towards uh, more of a middle ground. And we think this paper is, is hopefully maybe a, a first step towards something like that. So, Mayank, I think we've seen uh, some high-profile cases where law enforcement has said that, uh, you know, they, would, they, they need to be able to decrypt things to do their jobs and for uh, national security and public safety and so forth. And yet we've also reached this point where encryption isn't really an exotic thing that's difficult to do, so it's become routine for all of us to uh, use encryption on a daily basis. Certainly it's a fundamental part of the Internet and the things we do there. And I think we, there's been this, uh, sort of like Charles said, there's been this all or nothing that's that's ended up with people sort of taking one of two sides. And uh, there's the law enforcement side, and then there's the encryption side of this debate. Um, explain to me how can we reach a middle here? Is there is this not an all or nothing? It's a great question. So I think that you know the way that cryptographers have traditionally defined the notion of encryption, and it's something that I put on my first day of uh, class lecture slides, and most others do too, is um, encryption as a thing where there are three possible participants in the world. There's the sender of a communication, there's a receiver of a communication, and then there's an outsider who is trying to eavesdrop or somehow uh, gain access to this. And this is the full state of the picture. Uh, there are the two legitimate parties conducting the transaction who encryption is supposed to permit from a functionality point of view to actually be able to send and receive messages reliably. And there's outsiders who are just universally supposed to be excluded from access to the contents of this message. And essentially what we are thinking about in this paper 
is rather than just considering one category of every possible outsider to sort of split uh, our concern into to maybe two categories of outsiders, and there may even be more, but sort of the, the kinds of people who are uh, cyber criminals or, you know, so-called hacker types, people who, you know, I think most people would agree that the goal of encryption is to keep such people out of being able to access the contents of, of encrypted data. Uh, and also uh, law enforcement apparatuses of nation states who the answer to whether they should uh, be able to read the contents of uh, encrypted messages is a lot less clear. I don't know whether the answer is universally yes or universally no, but it might at least be a different answer than the answer that we give uh, when we think about cyber criminals as the outsiders snooping on encrypted traffic. Uh, and so the question that we have in this that that we pose at the start of this paper uh, is: Is there some sort of mechanism that we can use when designing an encryption scheme to distinguish between the law enforcement outsider and the cyber criminal outsider? The specific uh, mechanism that we use in this paper to distinguish between the two is economics that the law enforcement organization may have more resources available at its disposal than a cyber criminal and resources that they are uh, willing to use in order to promote some sort of benefit that is not some sort of uh, profit motivated endpoint. Whereas cyber criminals are motivated by sort of a profit motive, a risk reward thing, that maybe there are things that is in the public interest to read uh, but are not worth perhaps the resources on their own if we can make a sort of cryptographic puzzle that is solvable but at a very high cost then a law enforcement entity could judiciously choose when to use this limited capability to recover the contents of a few messages and maybe we can design the system in such a way that it's possible for law enforcement to do this while simultaneously not being of value or a uh, and other kind of outsider like a cyber criminal organization uh, to do so. And so when we talk about costs, are, are we talking about dollars and cents? Are we talking about time uh, or a combination of the two? Uh, essentially, the in the way that the current paper is written, which is not necessarily the way that it has to be, but just the way that we've currently written it, when we describe costs, what we mean are computing effort. So the money required to build and operate the, uh, you know, the electricity consumption required to operate a, a computing rig. So it's not like money in the sense of dollars flowing from one person to another, but in the sense of resources, uh, you know, computational and energy resources expended in order to recover the contents of the message. So, Charles, uh, take us through uh, conceptually what we're talking about here. I, I think um, when many of us think about uh, the ability to decrypt things, the, the popular uh, notion that's been put out there is key escrow, uh, and this is something different from that. Yeah. We talk a little bit in the paper about key escrow and some of the limitations of that approach. Um, there, there's been a lot of good work in our community analyzing and, and looking at some of the issues there. There's um, uh, a really great paper from from Hal Abelson and, and a lot of the, the the real rock stars of security and crypto research in the, in the 90s and 0s. And one of the major issues with key escrow is that, I mean, we talked earlier about this all or nothing problem we had where there, there wasn't really a middle ground. And, and key escrow falls victim to that, where really it's um, it's more on the, the all end of the spectrum, where uh, if you have escrowed keys, the idea there was that um, if you're going to encrypt a message, you need to give the authorities some way to open it back up. And the approach there was, well, you take your encryption key and you also encrypt it to you know with, with a key that's published by the authorities or, or maybe by some trusted third party like your ISP or your device provider or something, and uh, so that only they could, could open it up. And you encrypt that key, and you send it along with your message. So if anybody else sees it, they can't decrypt the key, and, and they can't uh, open up the message. But if the authorized third party, you know, your ISP in this case, or your device provider, or the law enforcement, you know, the FBI themselves, they can go and first decrypt your key for the message, and then use that to unlock the message. And there's really nothing to stop them from just going and, and applying that on every single message that they get. Um, and so it requires a lot of trust uh, that it won't be abused or misused, uh, that the authorized users won't get overzealous or won't be corrupt, and also that they will be very careful and competent to keep this capability, right? whatever allows them to, to unlock all those keys, that they will keep that secret and that they won't lose it and let some third party go and grab it. And now that you know, that third party can go and open up everything and everybody as well. 
Right. You end up with this sort of who watches the watchman kind of uh, situation. Exactly. Or, potentially. So your approach is using what you describe as moderately hard puzzles, and you talk about crumpling puzzles and abrasion puzzles. Um, describe to us what's going on here and how it, how it works. The crumpling puzzle is, is maybe the, the easier one to, to get started with. So there, the idea is that normally when we design a, an encryption scheme, a cryptographic key is just a long string of bits, and it's randomly chosen from such a, a huge space of possibilities that it, it's almost impossible to guess what it would be, and it's virtually impossible to try all combinations to find the right one. So normally we're talking you know, something like 2 to the 128, 2 to the 256. These are enormous numbers. Right? So for comparison, a million is only about 2 to the 20. Mm-hmm. And so uh, our approach is, well, maybe what if, what if we shrunk down that space and we made it not 2 to the 128 possibilities? What if we made it something smaller that is within the realm of of somebody big and powerful to pay for all the electricity to do the brute force search. And so we ran some numbers, created our scheme so that the keys are derived um, using the, the original key that, that the application like uh, like Skype or WhatsApp or Signal Private Messenger or, or whatever the, you know, the encrypted communication app is. Normally right now these are, are generating these long random 128, 256-bit whatever keys. So we use that as our initial secret to pick one of a, a much smaller number of keys. So for example, maybe two to the 60 or two to the 70. And we do that in such a way so that the brute force search of trying all the possibilities looks a whole lot like the function uh, that's used for Bitcoin mining right now. Mm-hmm. And so then we imagine that uh, a law enforcement agency like the FBI or MI5 or whoever it would be could then go and build hardware that looks a whole lot like a Bitcoin miner that they can get off the shelf and that they can do this search through, you know, say two to this. 60 or 2 to the 70 possibilities in about the same time that a, a Bitcoin miner takes to about the same time and about the same amount of electricity, most importantly, that a current Bitcoin miner takes. And so based on those numbers, we looked at, you know, kind of what's the best, most efficient Bitcoin miner you can go and buy right now. And it looks like a key space of about 2 to the 60. You can search in, I think, you know, if you're buying your electricity in the, the cheapest region of the U.S., it looks like about $1,000 to try all of those possibilities. And if you crank that up to 2 to the 70, right, so that's multiplying by 2 to the 10, which is about 1,000, it's no surprise that now you're spending about a million dollars in electricity. And so the notion is that that expense is what's going to be the, uh, the bottleneck, if you, were, if you will, uh, for folks to be able to decrypt things. Uh, that's one of them. That's, that's the main bottleneck, for example, that would, that would limit uh, abuse or misuse of the system by an authorized party like the FBI or, or MI5 or, or whoever it is. We also have this uh, bigger puzzle, this big gatekeeper puzzle, where you have to solve some really, really difficult puzzle uh, that we call the abrasion problem. And this uses some public key cryptography. We won't go into all the details now. We leverage some, uh, a recent attack on some public key crypto and we think, based on some, some numbers that we've read in the literature and some kind of back-of-the-napkin math that we did, we think we can make that one cost anywhere between about $150 million up to maybe $2 billion. And the idea is then that uh, someone like the FBI, who is in charge of national security and, and criminal investigations, would spend that money up front to pre-compute uh, a bunch of stuff that they can then use to solve simpler problems that we bake into the key generation algorithm. And we make that a necessary component for them to, to derive some secret information for each of those little keys that we're going to use on each message uh, to then go and do the brute force search to get the crumpled key. So in other words, the cost of entry to even have access to the, uh, the simpler puzzles is a big puzzle. Um, and so that way you're making sure that really only, for example, nation states would even have access to the simpler puzzles. That's the idea. Yeah. So... Without the abrasion puzzle, that if we make each message cost, say, $1,000 to recover, then if there's some message out there that I think is worth $10,000, I'm going to spend the 1000 I'm going to profit by 9000 right? On the other hand, if we have the abrasion puzzle there, then the total cost to get that one message would be, say, $2,000,000,000, and, and now that $10,000 message is not worth it anymore. Miyank, you all have a, a list of requirements that you think uh, would be necessary to make this a, a feasible, uh, and it's something that uh, key escrow falls short on. Can you take us through what these requirements are? So first of all, as Charles was saying earlier, there are some issues with key escrow uh, in terms of the fact that 
you know, because encryption so far has been this all or nothing thing. And with key escrow, it's effectively giving uh, the, the, the government apparatus a, a skeleton key, which gives it access to everything. That does not on its own uh, prevent, at least technologically, any kind of massive bulk surveillance. Uh, that the same key that is allowed, the, the same escrow key that the government can use to open targeted messages can also open arbitrarily many messages. And the only limitation on that would be any kind of apparatus that exists within the government to, uh, you know, uh, restrict its use and to prevent fraud and abuse kinds of uh, practices. Whereas in our system, uh, one of the requirements is for the system technologically to prevent sort of bulk mass scale surveillance. And it does so with the the fact that the crumpling puzzle poses a marginal cost on every single message transacted. Uh, the other requirements we have that also key escrow does not meet on its own is that we want to you know, keep the system as simple as possible for uh, both users to use and uh, developers to implement. And in particular, that neither one of them ever need to have any direct lines of communication with the, the government law enforcement apparatus at all. So no sending of escrowed key material or anything else for that matter. Maintain the kind of user workflow that uh, exists today, minimize the amount of new lines of code that are needed to be built in order to implement our puzzling techniques. And the final requirement that we have is to maintain all of the cryptographic best practices we have uh, developed over the course of the last few decades in terms of being able to design uh, schemes that pr provide simultaneously both confidentiality and integrity, uh, a, a system called authenticated encryption, which is very much in use now, and to be compatible with uh, other kinds of techniques that we use to protect key material, uh, such as hardware-based systems like hardware security modules or uh, any other kind of mechanism to protect key material locally, and to be compatible with notions like uh, perfect forward secrecy uh, in order to uh, limit the possible damage to one's uh, privacy that can happen if your computer is ever compromised and falls into the wrong hands. So we sort of want to uh, limit the ability technologically for mass scale abuse, uh, limit uh, uh, the increase in system complexity required to implement the system uh, and to maintain the system, and finally to maintain cryptographic best practices. With that having been said, if we step back for a moment and we think about what key escrow was trying to accomplish, at a very high level, it was trying to accomplish the same exact goal that I said our system was trying to accomplish in the sense of when we think about the intended recipients of a, an encrypted communication and then all of the various forms of outsiders, it was trying to find a way to distinguish between the government law enforcement outsider and the cyber criminal outsiders. It was trying to find a different way to uh, distinguish between them, right, by possession of this sort of skeleton key-like material. Uh, whereas we have a different mechanism, which is to distinguish them via economics. And I put them under the same framework here to, to make two points. One is that the two ideas can be used together, in which case one would get the, the strengths of both put together. And the second reason I mention this is to say these are just two different ways to distinguish between law enforcement outsiders and every other type of outsider like a cyber criminal. And maybe there are many different other ways, many other dimensions in which uh, one can distinguish between these two types of entities, uh, even beyond uh, you know, our paper or key escrow for that matter. Maybe they could be lumped together as well. And the more ways one has to distinguish, uh, then the, the stronger such a system might become. So how do you account for things like Moore's Law and, um, you know, coming quantum computers where it, presumably the, uh, the cost of computation is going to go down? Very good question. Uh, we discuss in the paper uh, that Moore's Law is definitely something that is a concern to the approach that we propose here in terms of the economics. One way that we propose to deal with the concern of Moore's Law is to have these abrasion puzzles and these crumpling puzzles themselves have the strength of them be tunable over time. Uh, so that they should the the way that one should implement such a system, if used in practice, would be uh, always continuously to be increasing the size of these parameters to keep up with Moore's law. That's uh, comment number one. Number two is to think about the scale of these parameters proactively based on Moore's law. What I mean by that is, if you think it would be an effective deterrent if it costs a thousand dollars for a cyber criminal to uh, to break, then if that's an effective deterrent. And if you want to withstand this kind of attack for a period of 10 years or so, 
you should design the parameters of the puzzle so that even 10 years from now, with the advances in Moore's law, that it will still be an effective deterrent even in the, to the future. And the third thing I would say in terms of combating Moore's law is coming back to my previous point about combining this economic space distinguisher together with other forms of distinguishing, which are not necessarily economic space. And this reduces the influence or, or the, the, the dependency of the system upon Moore's law. So sort of, you know, a defense in depth approach to combine many different kinds of distinguishers together could be one way to, to handle the concern of Moore's law. The question about quantum computers is somewhat similar, except it doesn't have so much of the regular uh, inflation rate, so to speak, that Moore's law has. It seems to be something that might be more of a, you know, a big cliff that once uh, once quantum computers exist, then that that enables a, a variety of new tasks that were not possible before. And with regards to quantum computers, I think the one thing that the cryptography community and many other uh, communities within computer science have already been thinking about are what are the kinds of problems that continue to remain difficult even in the presence of quantum computers and using those kinds of systems as the basis for crumpling or abrasion puzzles could be a way of making sure that the system withstands even quantum computers. That It is true that quantum computers make many problems easier. But it is also the case that there are many problems that quantum computers either don't make much easier at all, or we know fairly well how much easier they make uh, the problems. And so we can account for that in the analysis. Uh, Charles, are there, are there any areas where uh, you, you sense that uh, perhaps this approach uh, isn't the best approach, or maybe it comes up short? Have you found any, any areas uh, like that? Well, uh, sure. The system was, was designed to be used more or less in... Uh, representative liberal democracies, right, where the uh, the government and the law enforcement work for the people. And so you can imagine if we deployed something like this in, say, North Korea, there's really nothing to stop a guy like Kim from going and spending all the resources he wants to track down people that are criticizing him and, you know, let thieves and murderers and whatever run free. That is not at all how we were hoping the system might be used. And so, uh, you know, the, the benefits of having encryption in that case are... are mostly nullified and, and get all the all the drawbacks of, of earlier approaches like key escrow. And so I think that that's the major case where I think our, our ideas really wouldn't help much. I guess it's debatable about, about other countries. Like maybe it depends on, on your opinion of the various governments, whether you think it would be a, an acceptable risk to give them this kind of capability or not. And uh, I'm sure there's many, many different opinions out there. It may also be a, a, a great difference of opinion on how high the price should be for any particular government. I think that's you know that, that's a question for society more than for us. So we're just hoping to, to maybe find you know some mechanism that will get us to a middle ground that, that we can have this public to debate. We're just saying, hey, it would be cool if we had a dial at all. Yeah. Uh, and then once we have it, then we can we can all debate about where you know how high up we should you know should we dial it up or dial it down. And, and hopefully there can be some uh, more of a middle ground. Maybe not quite consensus, but. Um, a little more agreement than just a black and white issue that tends to um, divide people and get us riled up against each other. The other case where, where we really don't provide much help is for uh, a really, really high value target. And so as, as my uncle was saying a minute ago, uh, we provide some provable security for messages that are worth less than the total cost to recover them. And we don't give any guarantees at all for a message that's whose value is more than that. And so you have a, a guy like Snowden, um, you can imagine that uh, a government would, would want to spend the resources to track him down. You know, maybe also high, you know, candidates for high-level office might also fall into this. And it may not be safe for, for them to use something like this. And there's probably some, some other good examples. You know, maybe the CEO of Apple or Google, maybe their messages are, are worth enough money to motivate somebody spending this, these kind of resources to go and get them. Uh, and I, I think that's more of an, an interesting area for, for future work. I guess my hope right now is, is that we're providing some technologies that encryption providers can use when they are legally required to provide some sort of mechanism to give the authorities access. Right. I think if, if it comes to a point where there are new laws and regulations being put in place, uh, there's a lot of risk in that. And there's a, there's a lot of risk to um, having a situation where the technology continues to move fast and the regulations don't keep up. It's not clear how that might turn out, but there's a lot of risk, I think. Yeah, one of the things that comes to mind um, with me is the the granularity of the data. Um, in other words, you know, if uh, for example, if if someone got a search warrant to search my house, you know, they, they someone convinced a judge that um, 
you know, mm. I had done something bad and they could come basically uh, search through my house to find what they might find. Um, well, that warrant covers the whole house. Um, and yeah. I could see people saying, well, you know, if we have to spend $10,000 per text message, for example, and but we don't know which text message is the one that, that says, you know, I'm the murderer. So uh, <laughs> did you get, you get where I'm going right. with this? That right. uh, Wouldn't it be nice to be able to spend X amount of dollars and know that I'm going to be able to unlock the whole phone? I very much like the, the analogy you raised to the question of sort of a warrant on your house, because mm-hmm. I think that is very similar to the inspiration that we have in this paper, which is to say that the the warrant for your house is not something that is impossible for government to obtain. It's also something that the, the U.S. judicial system renders effectively impossible to abuse to a mass scale, that they cannot just simply request a warrant for everybody's house uh, when they have a, a high value investigation and just go on a, on a fishing expedition. Hmm. Uh, so it basically and and the 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 you know executing a warrant on the house even if they did even if law enforcement somehow magically got a warrant to everybody's house they wouldn't even be able to execute that right because actually going through and searching your house costs money it costs time right and they have limited resources and that forces them to be focused in terms of what kinds of things are of most value in terms of for the amount of time that they have at their disposal, what is the most uh, social good they can do for that? And what are the kinds of cases and what are the kinds of people uh, that are worth pursuing in order to be most worth the time uh, to do so? And what our work is trying to do is to say, maybe we can try to emulate that kind of thought process in the digital domain. Mm -hmm. So rather than making the marginal cost for law enforcement to recover information zero, And rather than making the marginal cost effectively infinite, can we make the marginal cost somewhere in the middle that it is possible but onerous to recover information in such a way that it forces law enforcement to be uh, judicious about its use of its limited funds to recover the messages of highest value, uh, but while still actually permitting them to do that to in order to deal with high value investigations, to you know close the cases on the high value investigations. Um, and to your question about sort of whether the the cost needs to be per message, the answer is no, that the so far we've described it for simplicity as just sort of these two levels of puzzles, this one level of an abrasion puzzle and this one level of a crumpling puzzle. But in the paper, we discuss that, you know that may not be, the like we we need not limit this just to two levels of alternation we do it in the most of the paper for simplicity just of of exposition but uh, one can consider many more levels of marginal costs per blah for different types of you know fill in the blank right so you can have you know one cost per geographic region so that you know you have to do an abrasion puzzle to even unlock the ability to recover messages in a particular geographic region region and that can be expensive enough that there's you know a limited ability to sort of you know spend the money in, in recovering messages in regions other than your own there can be a cost per particular software product that you want to be able to uh, as a law enforcement organization acquire the ability to read uh, contents of there can be a cost per user that uh, law enforcement targets. There can be a cost per pair of users or per communication session that is uh, um, targeted. And finally, a marginal cost per message. And maybe to the point that you you, you raised in your question about uh, making sure that maybe law enforcement should have the ability to um, read a full contents of a of a person's phone. If that is, if again, as, as Charles said, if that is sort of the, the the way that society decides to go about enforcing this, then you could make a high cost, a high marginal cost per user targeted or per phone targeted, but a low marginal cost per message or file targeted within that device. So that uh, on the you know you you can you can tune these costs as you see fit in order to appropriately handle the trade-off between giving law enforcement limited access to the contents they need in order to pursue investigations while simultaneously not giving uh, overreach into more contents than necessary in order to fulfill their obligations. One other thing to, to add to that, this, this ties into to what we were talking about Moore's Law. Normally we, we talk about, oh yeah, Moore's Law makes computation cheaper over time. Uh, and so in a way, we usually looked at, at that as kind of a, a limitation or a weakness of our scheme. If you look at it from a slightly different perspective, and you think you, you mentioned, you know, maybe a, a high value investigation like a like a murder case. Well, there's no statute of limitations on murder, and so if I have all these text messages, and I, you know, I'm pretty sure within one of these twenty or thirty or a hundred, 
Uh, there's going to be you know, an incriminating message that's going to make my case that, yes, this guy did it, and we're going to be able to get him. Well, you know, if Moore's Law makes computation 50% cheaper every 18 months, right, I can wait, say, three years, and now the cost is, is only 25% of what it was originally. And that, you know, that may be enough to, to go back and, and, and solve some cold cases uh, for a cost that is, is bearable for an important thing like a murder investigation, whereas if we could prevent another 9-11, we would have spent the, the millions or however much it was in the beginning, uh, but to maybe for a shoplifting case or, uh, you know, uh, petty vandalism or something, it probably won't ever be worth it. So where do we go from here? Uh, you all have put this out into the world. Um, people are going to uh, absorb it. Uh, what would you like to see come from this? Personally, I think that there are two things I would like to see from this. The first is in the current debate about encryption technology and its appropriate role in society, I think we've been stuck as a society on this question of, is it technologically possible to achieve some sort of appropriate trade-off between law enforcement access to contents and the right to privacy? I don't think this is the interesting question. And I'm, by the way, I'm not saying it's not interesting or, or, or that it is solved in any way by this paper. I think this paper is a beginning to this uh, exploration of how one can sort of balance these two, but not the end of that. But it's just the beginning. But nevertheless, I don't think the question of is it technologically possible is the interesting question here to, to discuss. Uh, it, I mean, it's, it's not the most interesting question for society. What's the interesting question, I think, is, you know, what is the appropriate role we want as a society for law enforcement to have? And it may very well be the case that we decide as a society that um, even if some sort of trade-off uh, in encryption is technologically possible, that we simply don't want it as a society. That's a perfectly valid answer that, you know, maybe the right to privacy, its importance as both both for individuals and as a social function, the right to privacy enables us to be better as a society. That may be so worth it that it is worth the cost of maybe not closing some of those cases that Charles was describing uh, earlier. And if that is the decision that is made by society, then so be it. And then, you know, our paper goes on a shelf never to be used, and that's fine. And I think that that's a totally reasonable answer to this question. And I think this is the more interesting question of debate that's currently blocked by the question of, is it technologically possible? But rather than asking, you know, what is technologically possible with encryption, what we should be asking is, what is the appropriate role that we want for law enforcement to have in the digital world? And what is the kind of encryption that we want in order to reinforce whatever that role is? One of the things we talk about, well, we're going to be presenting this in April in London. And so hopefully, as the, the rest of the scientific community kind of gets its teeth into this, uh, other people can hopefully come up with some ideas or ways to make it better, uh, to maybe reduce some of these limitations that we talked about earlier. Uh, you know, for example, maybe providing better protection to high value targets or coming with, up with other kinds of puzzles or other kinds of distinguishers between what we're kind of calling a, a legitimate outsider versus a an illegitimate cyber criminal type of outsider. And I guess at the same time, I like the idea that, that now uh, we as the security and privacy community, we have a fallback position. In case something really bad happens in the past, we potentially could have been looking at a total ban on encryption or you know some uh, virtually unlimited kind of backdoor coming down either through legislation or through courts. I think right now there's court cases where people have been held in contempt of court for refusing to disclose a password uh, to decrypt a device, for example. That, that seems not a great thing for a democracy. And so at least now we have some sort of a, a fallback mechanism. You know, if, if we can't have high strength encryption uh, available everywhere, well, maybe we have something that uh, still provides a lot of protection. And so in the past where companies like BlackBerry um, was nearly forced out of India in I think 2010, and then more recently, WhatsApp was was temporarily banned a couple of times in Brazil. And I think in, in both of those cases, the you know, the ability of people in those countries to to use those services with encryption on has been restored. But in the future, we, you know, we, we may not always win. And so uh, this gives us a fallback so that rather than people in countries like, like that losing all ability to have encrypted communications, maybe now uh, we have that's something that the next BlackBerry or the next WhatsApp could use to get a, a better balance that might be acceptable. Our thanks to Charles Wright and Mayank Varia for joining us. The title of their paper is Crypto Crumple Zones, Enabling Limited Access Without Mass Surveillance. 
We've included a link to the paper in the show notes for this episode. Thanks to the Hewlett Foundation Cyber Initiative for sponsoring our show. You can learn more about them at hewlett.org slash cyber. And thanks to Envale for their sponsorship. You can find out how they're closing the last gap in data security at envale.com. The CyberWire Research Saturday is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. It's produced by Pratt Street Media. The coordinating producer is Jennifer Iben. Editor is John Petrick. Technical editor is Chris Russell. Executive editor is Peter Kilpie. And I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.